And if you didn't grow up in church, uh, the Psalms um, is kind of a collection of poetry and songs written to and about God. And so um, that's what we're going to be, you know, kind of diving into this morning. And if a really easy way to find the Psalms is just kind of take your Bible and go right to the middle. Like that was always the Sunday school way to do it. Like you can't find the book of Psalms, just like find the middle and go, ah, and usually you're going to hit the book of Psalms. It's right in the middle. And uh, this morning we're actually going to be going over a Psalm uh, that was written by David. Now, if you don't know who David is, um, like personally, huge man crush on David. I'm just going to be, I'm going to be real and transparent with you. Like huge man crush because David, he is one of those guys, he's kind of a man's man. Like, you know, he was a shepherd. He was a hunter, like literally recorded in scripture. The guy takes a lion by the mane and like punches it in the face. Like my hero. Like I'm just saying like major man crush. But then what's cool about David is through the Psalms, We actually see and and get to read like David's soul. Like the guy pours out himself in written word for us to read thousands of years later. And that's why I love studying David even, you know, like obviously Jesus is number one, but David is a pretty close second because he's so relatable. He's so relatable in that he experienced these super high highs. You know, he had a prosperous kingdom. Um, The guy was liked by most all. Again, like, if you're punching lines in the face, you must be doing something right. Like, I'm just saying, like, super, super high highs. And then David had some pretty low lows, right? If you know David's story, David experienced some pain. David experienced some turmoil. And a lot of it was actually by his own doing. He, He slept with another man's wife and then murdered that guy to kind of cover it up and they ended up having a baby out of, out of wedlock and that caused all kinds of family issues he was he was hunted he was driven out of his kingdom like pretty high highs pretty low lows and that's why i love studying david again he's just so relatable to us today in that i think we can express emotion just like david did and guys we need to take a little bit um of a hint from david that you know, it's okay for us to be men, and you know, like, like meat, and uh, driving trucks, and uh, you know, like men, yeah. but we got to be able to pour out our souls to our wives, not to each other, like, let's not make it weird, like, let's do it to your wives and people that actually want to hear it, so, um, no, we got to learn how to do that, <laughs> Lindsay's like, oh man, no, we got to learn how to do that, like, as men, we got to be able to be men, but we got to be able to be men, and when, and when life Happens. We need to be able to express how that's going. And that's why it's so crucial that we read the Psalms because as we study through the book of Psalms throughout the summer, we're going to be able to hear the very depth sometimes of, of David's soul. And David, as he writes Psalm 30, is actually looking back across his life and he's looking back at the joy that was brought to him by God. Again, if you know his story, there was a lot of things that David could have walled about. There's a lot of things that David could have, could have sat in the darkness about. There's a lot of things that David, if he dwelt on it, if his perspective was focused on the bad, the negative, the ugly, there was plenty of him for, to choose from. There was plenty to choose from for him in his life. Be it in Psalm 30, this is a look back and he recounts the joy. In fact, I want to put before you for consideration this morning that joy is a matter of perspective. That living a life of joy is simply a matter of perspective. And that if you are hurting this morning, if you are having one of those weeks, one of those years, one of those seasons, and you're like, man, I have nothing to be joyful about. Will you just get off the stage? I don't want to hear anything that you have to say. I want to encourage you this morning. I believe God wants to encourage you this morning. And that joy and having a joy-filled life is simply just a matter of perspective. And when our perspective changes to that of joy, life begins to make a little bit more sense. I'm already starting to preach. Hold on, I gotta pause. I'm gonna pray um, before we dig deeper into this passage. I'm I'm encouraged this morning because I know and I believe that God's truth is gonna work in our lives this morning. So let's pray, especially be praying for the accident or whatever that was on the highway and then just praying for our time together. So let's pray. God, we, we first come before you and just say thank you and your goodness and your grace and your love for us. Father, I do want to pray um, for whatever was happening up, up the highway. God, we know that uh, usually when, when fire trucks and ambulances are going that fast, uh, something's not, not good. And so we just want to pray for your healing hand 
Uh, we want to pray that you would be with whoever is involved with the accident or whatever's going on, that God, that you would just be there giving wisdom to the paramedics, wisdom um, to, to the doctors and everybody else that's kind of going to be involved. Uh, Father, we know that you can restore. We know that you can heal. And I just pray that your, uh, your peace would be there with all those involved. I pray for this morning. I pray that, God, that you would uh, help us to breathe a little bit. That, God, as life wants to crush us, wants to pin us down, I pray that you'd help us to breathe a little bit. I pray this morning is an encouragement. And, God, may your truth be spoken this morning. And all God's people said, amen. I like to tell people this often, in fact, I'm told this often about myself, that I'm, I'm a pretty active guy. I love going for hikes, I love wrestling with my boys, I love playing sports, like just being outdoors and all that, it's awesome, I love it. If You can ask my wife, if I sit for too long, I get real crabby, like it's not, like she's like, go outside and do something. I just love to be active and just be doing stuff kind of all the time, because um, if I don't, I get really bored and I become obnoxious, and you're like, you can get more obnoxious? Anyway, but shh, that's... You keep that to yourself. Um, but what, what's amazing is that, you know, a lot of times throughout my life, I've found that if I want to pick up a new hobby or want to try something new, that it, a lot of times things come pretty natural to me. And I'm like, wow, God, thanks for that gift. If I practice, and usually I'm, because I'm pretty competitive, so I don't like being that guy, right? I don't like being the guy picked last for anything. So it's like if I am picked last, my soul is destroyed. Um, I go home and cry, and then I practice and get better. Um, but, but there is one, one very sobering, ego-bursting, humiliating um, exception to that rule. Bowling. I don't know what it is, but like God, just when he was making me, he's like, I'm not making this guy a bowler. Like, and as, and as he probably is like, this guy's going to bowl someday. Guys, we're going to watch this. It's going to be hilarious. Like, I, I'm a terrible bowler, you guys. Like, it's so bad. And so I have to I have to, before I bowl, give myself a little bit of a pep talk because, you know what, I'm a competitive guy, so I got to give myself a pep talk. So actually, this Wednesday, uh, we went out to Langford Lanes as a youth group and kind of just reconnect over the summer. It's always good to do that. And as I'm driving out, I pull in. This is just literally the conversation I have with myself. I pull up, and I'm like, okay. <sighs> Kenan, it's just a game. You're not going to get frustrated. It's just a game. Like, Jesus loves you, man. Like, what, what else? I mean, he does. He loves you so much. Like, your wife is so ridiculously good-looking. You do not deserve her, but she loves you anyway. What do you have to worry about? It's just a game. Literally the conversation I have with myself, and I'm like, okay, I can do this now. But then I go and I start bowling, and I'm like, hey, like, things are going pretty well. Like, I'm like, for myself, I am like, I'm stringing some strikes together. I'm like, where? I'm telling my youth leaders, I'm like, guys, we should start a bowling league because I'm kind of amazing at this game. I don't know if you've seen me, but I don't know what's going on. Jesus does love me. And so as I'm bowling, and I'm not a curver, like I'm not of that, just, I'm like just pure, raw, straight power. Just like the explosion of pins is just hitting everything. That's, that's my technique. Take it if you want, but that's my technique. And then as I'm bowling so well, again, I lean over to some of my students, and I just go, you know, guys, we should just get some water to cool me down. Like, I don't know what the deal is. I'm just on fire right now. <laughs> oh, wait. Hold, yeah, just hold on now. And then if you know anything about bowling, the open frames start coming. The splits start coming. You know, we're, we're like, I'm, I, I, I'm telling you the ball is being thrown this direction, but it's going that direction and that direction. And there's like, like people around me are afraid. Like it's, it's, it turns very, very quickly um, to the point where, you know, I, at first I'm like, let's guys, we got to bone a joint, like join a bowling league because we're bringing home trophies, y'all. Like, like it turned from that to it's a stupid game. I hate this game. This is so dumb. Like, why are we here? Who, who makes this game? It's, it's just throwing a ball down a wooden lane. Ooh. If I can eat nachos while I'm playing the game, it's not a sport. Right? Can I get an amen, right? Like, so that's my attitude, right? It, it totally, totally shifts and changed based on how I played the game, right? My, my perspective changed based on my circumstances. When the game was going great, woo, let's join a league, let's go. And then as soon as it was not going well, stupid game, right? And that's the danger that's the danger when we allow life circumstance to dictate our perspective. That's the danger of what happens when, when we look out at life and things are going really, really well. And we're like, 
let's do it. Like, you're ready to conquer. You're just like, I'm ready for anything. And then the moment that it switches, the moment that your circumstances go sideways, and can we be honest? Life circumstances go sideways more often than not. The moment that they go sideways, you begin to ask even deeper questions, harder questions. What's the point? Ugh, what's the point? Man, my, my family's just driving me crazy. I just wish I had a different family. I wish I could just change all of it and it would be better. Man, if I just made more money, if only I just made more money, if my, my job I just can't stand anymore, if I just made more money, I could leave my job and everything would be better. Man, if I didn't marry this person, man, I tell you what though, if I married this person, oh, then I'd feel loved. Good grief. See how dangerous that is when we begin to believe the lies that the world has to offer? When our perspective shifts away from joy and shifts toward our circumstances, when we allow our circumstances to dictate our perspective, we begin to believe lies that we never thought we'd believe. We begin to go into areas that we never thought we would go simply because our perspective was so low. Our perspective was based solely on our circumstances. And this morning, I, I, I honestly believe this. I believe that God wants to encourage you with his truth. I believe this morning that God has something for all of us and to hear his truth, that joy, joy is beyond circumstance. And as we look to God, as we focus on Christ, as we do that, that God is above our circumstances. And that is why our circumstances should not dictate our perspective, because our God is above our circumstances. And so I know that God is going to encourage us this morning, because as Christians, our perspective needs to be that of joy and to be that on Christ. So we start Psalm 30, and, and, and as we've learned about David again he is a guy who is very expressive and so he starts in verse one he says I will extol you O Lord for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me O Lord my God I have cried out to you for help and you have healed me O Lord you have brought my soul up from Sheol you have restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit David looks back and he remembers what God has done and that's the reason for his praise. That's the reason that David is, is praising God's name because he's looking back. But did you notice that David actually brings up kind of three sections of his life? Remember, it's at the end of his life he's remembering all this. And so David kind of brings up these three sections of the human experience that we experience every single day. And David recounts the joy that God brought to those areas. The number one place was kind of those life circumstances, right? His foes did not rejoice over him. It's that kind of physical life circumstance, the stuff that happens around us, that his foes did not rejoice over him, that his foes didn't have the final say, that his foes were not victorious over David. And so David recounts this, and he gives praise to God, and he says, yes, you did deliver me from that. Thank you, God, for delivering me from my enemies, these life circumstances. And then the second thing he brings up is almost this emotional level, this emotional circumstance that when David cries out to God, or when he cries out to him that the Lord responds and the Lord restores and that the Lord heals. You know those, you know those times where you, like you, you can't breathe because of the stuff that's going on in your life? Those times when, the, like, just at your very heart, like, your heart has a hard time beating and you have a hard time getting out of bed because you're like, this is too hard. I can't do this anymore. God, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't, I can't, I can't. When we're in that mode, what's, what's our only option? We cry out to God. All right, so that's what David's getting at here. He's getting at that, that when we are just in it, when we are in that depressive, cannot get out of bed state, when it's just, oh, God heals and restores. He recounts this and finds joy and praise in that. And this third section I actually found very interesting that David would bring it up. Right? David, toward the end of that kind of stanza, 
In verse 3, it says, O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have restored me to life from among those who would go down to the pit. David is actually recounting the salvation that is found in God. He's recounting the salvation that is found for his soul. And so David's recounting these soul circumstances. Like the very depths of who we are at our core, our soul circumstances. And David recounts this. And notice he's like, all praise. Right? All praise. Because the first two, David goes, yeah, my enemies, they were real. But they didn't have the final say. My emotions were real. I was in the depths and I cried out to you and you restored. But David's recount of the third kind of human experience, this soul experience is simply, God, you have saved me. You have rescued me. You have restored me. And that's where I found that so interesting because as Christians, as Christians, that is where our joy needs to flow from. Our soul is the spring in which the joy should flow from. Why? Because of what Christ did on the cross. Our soul, the very depths of who we are, eternally, we are made complete in Christ. We're made complete in Christ. He has restored us. He has healed us. He has brought us back to himself. He has made us righteous at our soul. Let that sink in. Our soul is complete in Christ. Yes, life's going to happen. Yes, there's going to be things that absolutely tear us apart on the inside. But it will not, it cannot, it should not mess with our soul. Because our soul is made complete. In fact, it's made so complete that our soul is actually back and restored to the way it was supposed to be in the beginning. That is what Jesus did for us on our behalf, is he made our soul back to the way we were designed in the beginning. And that is why, as Christians, we should be the most joyous people on the planet. <laughs> like, we should be obnoxious about our joy. Okay? Can I be honest with you? Like, like, actually, can I just get an amen on that? Like, like, we should be obnoxious about our joy. Like, there should be something where people look at us as Christians and go, weirdos. Yeah, weirdos. If you never were, like, called a weirdo, I was a lot as a kid, like, just join the club. Like, weirdos. Like, as life seems to just keep coming at these people, they just keep getting up. Like, I don't understand it. How has life not broken them by now? It's because we're made complete. We're made complete in Christ. We are to be the most joyous people on the planet because we have hope to hold on to. We have Christ to hold on to. That is why we need to be so full of joy, no matter what circumstances around us, that this joy needs to flow out. It needs, it, it, hear that word? Needs to flow out. Because then David, he implores us, if we continue to unwrap this idea of what a joyful perspective looks like, he says this, sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints. That's us. And give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Thank you, Jesus. Can I hear an amen? Like, whoo! Thank goodness his anger is only for a moment. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Mm. Life shouldn't debilitate us. I use that word very carefully. Life shouldn't debilitate us. It hurts. Can I, can I be honest with you? Life hurts. Oh, does it hurt. And it continues to hurt. And pain seems to be everywhere. And every time that we step outside, even these walls, and we're not around our community, where we're like, hey, this is great. Love coming together as a church on a Sunday morning and just praising Jesus. Woo, this is good. As soon as we exit, man, it just wants to hit against us. Life is painful. And that's why Jesus wept. That's why Jesus wept. If you recount that story, I love this story. 
right? Jesus' best friend dies. Lazarus was put into a tomb. And Jesus, if you know the story, Jesus knows, okay? Jesus knows that he's about to raise his friend from the dead. So he's gonna make everything okay. He's gonna restore all things. He's gonna heal his buddy and raise him back from the dead. Like, awesome. But as he turns and looks at the other family members, his other friends, they're in turmoil. They're crying. They're grieving. They're mourning. And what does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't scold them. He doesn't say, where's your faith? Come on, I'm gonna actually restore that. What, what are you doing? Stand up, wipe the tears away. There's no crying, come on. No, he, he sits down with them and Jesus weeps. Not cries, Jesus weeps. Why does Jesus weep? He knows he's gonna restore, he knows he's gonna heal. Why does he weep? Because the pain is real. The pain is real. And Jesus recognizes the fact that it was not supposed to be this way. Right? That, that pain and death and suffering and all the stuff that we experience in our life circumstances, that's not the way it was designed. That's not the way it was supposed to be. So Jesus sits with us in our pain and he weeps because he knows that's not how it was supposed to be. And then like a boss, Jesus stands up and he goes, Yo, Lazarus! Come on out, bud. Come on out. Come on, you. Restores. He heals. But yet he sits with us in our pain because he understands that the pain is real. I don't know how people survive day in, day out life without Christ. I don't. And frankly, I don't want to know. <laughs> I love them, and that's why I will never cease to praise his name, never cease to run after people and say, do you know about the love and, uh, and grace of, of Jesus? Do you know what he's done for you? You don't have to earn it anymore. You don't have to strive anymore. Like, I will never stop doing that because I don't want to know what life is like without Jesus. I don't want to know. I don't know how they do it. Because when we rest in Christ, man, there is strength there. Man, there is a perspective change when we lean on Christ. There is a joyful perspective that even when life is absolutely hitting the fan, we can find a joyful perspective in Christ. And so David lays out the fact that life's going to go up and down. In verse 6 and 7, he, he agrees with us in our study through this that life is going to go up and down. He says this in verse 6, as for me, I said in my prosperity, right? Life was going good. I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. Life is going great. David's like, let's conquer it. Let's do this, God. And you hide, or you hid your face. And I was dismayed. But I, I hid my face. And so when God seems so far away, when, when God seems to, to leave us, when life doesn't seem to go the way we want it to go, when we hit those valleys, those dark areas, and, and he, 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 he hides his face from us, or it seems like it. We're in dismay. We don't know how to feel. Because now we're separate. We're like, what is this? We wrestle with this. But even though we find ourselves in the darkness, we are called, and I implore you, to cry out in the darkness for God. Because then David continues. He says, To you, O Lord, I cry. And to the Lord I plead for mercy. For what profit is there in my death? You should talk to God like this. When you're in the depths of it, when you're like, I cannot seem to go on, talk to God like this. Be like, yo! God, does it profit? What, 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 what good is it? What, what good is my death to you? Right? Will the dust praise you? Oh, David. Listen to that. Almost borderline sarcasm. Will the dust praise you? Come on, God. Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? David understands. He's like, of course God's going to deliver. Of course God's going to restore. Of course God's going to make new. Of course he is, because what does it profit God to leave us in our sorrow? What does it profit God to leave us in the pain? What does it profit God to leave us when all of it starts to just crumble around us? What does it profit him? Do you really think that God is looking at your life circumstance and just going like, well, I guess they'll figure it out eventually. What good does that do him? Really, what, what good is that doing? Because our job as his creation is to sing his praise. 
Our job is, as his creation is to proclaim his goodness, proclaim his faithfulness, proclaim his praise. So what good is it for God to just leave us there in our sorrow? No, no, no. No, no, no. He will deliver. Of course he's going to restore. Of course it's going to get better. Of course he's going to walk with us. God is not a helicopter God. When things get hard, when things get difficult, God is not always just going to come in and just pluck us out of our difficult circumstances. Not always. Sometimes maybe. More often than not, he's going to sit with us in our pain, and he's going to walk us through it. He's going to walk us through it. Because he knows on the other end, he's going to restore And that's why our perspective must be that of joy. Friends, I want to put again before you that David's plea is that of joy. Even though he's had ups and downs in his own life, at the end of it, he looks back and he recounts the joy. He recounts how good God is. Then David kind of wraps up this psalm. Wraps up the psalm with this declaration. He says, hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have turned, right? That, that's, that's process. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have loosened my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. And that my glory, right? As God restores David, David then declares back to God, that my glory may sing your praises and will not be silent. That, oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. And maybe this morning you're thinking there is nothing. There is nothing that I can give praise for. There's nothing that I can find joy in this morning. I I, I don't want to hear what you're trying to say. Friends, God is turning your mourning into dancing. He is loosening your sackcloth, to clothe you with gladness. If this morning you're thinking there's no reason to be joyful, brace yourselves. Brace yourselves. The perspective needs to change in that God is working, God is doing something, and that fact that God is walking with you should give us an incredible amount of peace. You're not left alone. Of course he's going to restore. Of course he's going to heal. On the other end, when we go through it, we always look back and we're like, oh, wow, yeah. Oh yeah, he did. He did it there, and 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 he did it there. God is not going to leave you now. Of course, he's going to restore. Why? Because he's clothed you in himself. He's clothed you in himself. Right, that, 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 that gladness that, that, that David's talking about, that, that gladness, he's clothing you in himself. He's clothing you in the blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ. That is why, as Christians, we need to be joyful. Again, I put before you, people should think we're weird. People should be like, I don't understand. Because the love and the grace and the peace and the understanding that God brings goes beyond all understanding. People should look at it and go, Man, they're a bunch of whack jobs. Amen. Bring it on. Because the fact that our God will restore us back to himself is ridiculous. The fact that we have life at all is ridiculous. The grace that Jesus brings because of the cross is ridiculous. So we should live ridiculously. We should live such a ridiculously joy-filled life and have this joyful perspective no matter what life throws at us that people should be like, I don't understand. I don't get it. Why? Why? Because of Jesus. Though the sorrow may last for the night, joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. Wait, may we not be silent about what God has done. May we not be silent of what he continues to do. And may we not be silent of his goodness, his grace, and the joy that he brings. Because again, I put before you that it's simply a matter of perspective. Simply a matter of perspective. 
that even if life around you is just falling apart, at the very least, you have the perspective to look back and go, you know what, my soul is complete. My soul is taken care of. Because of Christ, nothing that I did, I'm restored. I'm made righteous because of Christ. You preach that to yourself when it all seems to crumble around you. Life will bend you, but it shall not break you. It will bend you. It will try. It will come after you, but it will not. It should not, and it can't break you because you are made complete in Christ, and that cannot be broken. That cannot be changed. That is the good news of our joyful perspective in Christ. And as we observe communion, right, as, as we look to this table and as we go, man, God, you are so amazing as we remember, as we look back, as we declare his goodness, right, as we remember all the things that God has done for us, in us, through us, whatever it is, as we just remember his goodness and his grace, it's such a picture of what joy is. Because his body was broken. His body was ripped apart. But he went to that cross with a joyful perspective because he knew what it was going to do for you and for me. He knew about the restoration. He knew he was going to bring it back to life. He knew. Joy, <laughs> joy doesn't exist in the absence of pain. But its perspective, but its focus, is beyond our current circumstance. Let me say that again. That joy does not exist in the absence of pain, but its focus is beyond our current circumstance. This joyful perspective that we need to live in needs to be a daily thing. <laughs> needs to be a daily thing. Jesus died for us. May we live like he died for us. May we live like our soul is complete. Let's pray.